wow, I feel like, I feel like, you know, I didn't come to church. I really feel like I've been here to praise and worship the Lord with you all. We've been doing a series of messages. First of all, I'd like for you to keep us in prayer. Keep me in prayer. Um, once a year, I get to go see my boys, and my son, my oldest son, Doug's making it a little harder for me. They both lived in Florida, but now one of them lives in Tennessee. So I'm flying out, at least I think so. Um, I don't know what happened to you, but uh, on Friday, uh, Paul and I were discussing some things in my office, and at 1021, my desk shook, and my chair shook. Can you relate? An earthquake, go figure. And then you go on line or you go to the internet and you'll see a picture of of the statue of liberty that 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 statue that represents freedom and you'll see lightning striking it from the top of the torch down and then you hear about the wars and the and the rumors of wars and you and you hear about all the atrocities of life and what's happening today never before in the annals of time has the word of god had greater significance and importance as it does now and we need to study to show ourselves approved unto God. So we've been doing a series of messages on closing the door to the enemy, spiritual warfare. And then we've also been sharing the last few weeks that God has given us a new set of clothing. I mean, you all look really, really sharp at Easter. I mean, not that you don't look sharp all the time. <laughs> Help me, Lord. <laughs> but you really look sharp. Amen. And I know, I have a confession to make, and uh I'm not going to go to the priest. I'm, I'm going to go before the Lord, first of all, in the congregation that I love so dearly. I remember years ago, I don't know if I did it with the right motive in my heart. I, I just said, well, you know, let's, let's dress down and let's be comfortable. And how many know that, you know, God loves us the way we are? Amen. But I, I know for me, some of you have said to me, well, Pastor, why do you wear a tie? I don't, I don't mandate, to in, mandate that to anybody who's visiting pastor or anything like that. It's just that God brought conviction to my heart. Sometimes, you know, I went to court this week because we had a problem with somebody destroying our field, and I went there to represent our church. You know what I did? That was a courthouse. I was standing before the judge. You know what I wore? Suit and a cloth. Suit and tie. Now, don't misunderstand what I'm saying, okay? Pastor's saying that you must dress up to come to church. I'm not saying that. No more am I saying that it's bad for you to, to go over your Bible on your iPad or your phone. But I can remember when God said to me, I want you to take this book. I want you to open it. I don't want you to do an iPad or a phone. Nothing wrong with that if you do that. But I want you to open up this word, and I want you to hold it up when you preach it. One of the greatest preachers and evangelists to ever live was, was who? Billy Graham. He said, the Bible said so those are convictions that God brought, brought in my heart personally. And why are you saying that? I, I, I'm not saying that you've got to dress up to come to the house of God. Come as you are. But I know for me, when I, when I made that mandate, something happened in me like it did when I was getting up here and, and preaching from my iPad and, and the Bible on my iPad. God brought heavy conviction to me personally. So is it all right if I confess to you? Amen. You understand what I'm saying? Don't leave here and say, well, I can't go back to church again if I don't have a shirt and tie. That's a lie from the pit of hell. That's not what I said. Amen. Would you stand with me for the word of God, not for Pastor Wayne, the word of God. We're, we're teaching and preaching from Ephesians chapter 6. Finally, my brethren, it's, it's in chapter 6, verse 10. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you might be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God. You might be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Stand, therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith, with which you will be able to uh, quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end, with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. You may be seated. I want to preach on today. We, we have a real high budget. We, we put a lot of money into props. These are my boots. And somebody started singing, these boots are made for walking. 
And I got peace there. So that's, that's the extent of our, our expensive props. The shoes of peace. I ask you a question. Do you need peace in your life this morning? Do you need peace in your life this morning? Paul is teaching us here. He's, he's talking about the whole armor of God. And he's saying, And your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. We're not talking about any ordinary shoes. They were made of bronze. And they were made of brass. And usually brass. And they were, they were made in two parts. The grave... Uh, the grieve, excuse me, was the, was, uh, the shoe itself, or, or the, the shoe of faith. And then there was these greaves are, that used to come up. That I wanted to get some, actually, I, had, I knew some he, uh, catchers, you know, uh, and they had the catcher's equipment and they got the, the, the shin guards. Thank you. That, it's similar to that, that they would, they would go all the way up here and they would go all the way down to their feet. And this would protect the soldier. Beloved, the Bible says, put on the armor of God. The shoes were made of what? Overturn your bulletin. And on the back, I want you to fill in those. And we're not going to call you to come up front, but I think that it will help you. We're not talking about these ordinary shoes. These were shoes and they, they looked like boots made of brass. And, and the shoe itself was made of two pieces of metal. And on the top and the bottom, the foot was covered with fine pieces of brass. The sides were held together with many pieces of strong leather. And on the bottom of the shoes were dangerous spikes. Sometimes those spikes could be as long as one to two inches. But in battle, most certainly, many times they would be three inches. I don't know what kind of streets they had. If they had cobblestone streets or whatever they were. But just picture in your mind thousands of soldiers with boots and shoes with spike on, spikes on them walking over those cobblestones and the enemy is with fear and trepidation because they're walking in cadence. They're one army. They're united together. God has created the army of the living God. You and I are a part of the army of God if we are Christians and we know Christ is our Savior. Are you glad that you're part of His army? How many military do we have here today? Former military, stand to your feet. Military, former military. Come on, give them a hand. Thank you for your service to our country. Everywhere I go, it was just yesterday, everywhere I go, if I see anybody that resembles a vet, I'm going to go up to them and I'm going to shake their hand and thank them for their service to the kingdom. Thank God that freedom is not free. But over 2,000 years ago, Jesus died on the cross of Calvary for our sins. He transferred us from, from, a, from an army of, uh, amongst people that could help the government and help our community. We are a part of the family of God. We are the army of God. And God has given us new sets of clothing. You know what these shoes were? They were killer shoes. They were killer shoes. I played sports and, 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 you know, football, basketball, baseball. I can remember in football that more than one time I, I had those cleats, those spikes. When you're, when you're going out for a pass and you miss it or somebody spikes you. Um, you know, those cleats that, that they would have that, that, that really could... could uh, I know uh, Dustin Bedoya that was a, a, a great player for the Red Sox and somebody slid into second with a cheap shot, come up and, and, and spiked him and his, his, uh, actually his whole career came to a close because of that. I want you to picture this army. I want, I want you to picture these, these shoes, these spikes, these, these shoes of stability that God has given us. And, and that the peace that he infiltrates our heart with. So, Pastor, if these shoes were made this way, how can they equate peace? I mean, how can these spikes and these shoes equate peace? Peace as a powerful weapon, both defensive and offensive. They, 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 what it did is it protected us. It would also provide strength. It would be a lethal weapon for that artillery. So, so how, Pastor, can this, how can we fit into this? If you and I will use the weapon of peace correctly, it will keep the enemy underneath our feet. The peace of God. I thank God for peace. Peace 
The world needs peace. The world's looking for safety. The world cannot have peace without the Prince of Peace, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Can I get a witness? We can't have peace without the Prince of Peace. And Paul is telling us here to stand firmly and to tie peace around your life. Let me go a little further. Peace and, and the strategies against the enemy is, is, is so that he can be crushed is very important. Having your feet shod with, a, with, with peace, and, and shod in the Greek is a compound word. It's hupo and dio. Hupo means under, and dio means to bind. So put together this Greek word. It means binding something very tightly on the bottom of your foot. Paul is telling us to stand firmly in the peace and to let peace be tied around our life and infiltrate our life so that we can have the peace of God that passes all understanding. People are looking for peace. Outside of Jesus Christ, there is no peace. I remember I used to party hardy just like maybe you all did or maybe you didn't. Maybe you were just a good sinner. There is no such thing as a good sinner. And I can remember being miserable, waking up the next morning with a big head and an empty heart, saying there's got to be more to life than walking into a church such as this and the pastor standing up there preaching and I felt he knew the God that he was preaching about. And I came under heavy conviction and I boogied on out of that church before I made a decision for Christ because I was convicted. I was convicted of the way I was living. But shortly after that, God's word does not return void. And I said, God, if you're real, come into my life. And it was at that moment when I received Jesus into my heart and life that I received peace. Is there anybody in the house that's got peace in your heart today? Peace. And what he's saying here is you've got to have it firmly affixed to your life, around your emotions, around your mind. How are we doing on that? The enemy, here's the battleground between our ears. He's trying to attack our minds. But we must wrap peace around our mind and our heart and our emotion. When peace has a firm grip in our lives, we are ready for action. We are ready for action. Having your feet shod with a preparation. What's the word preparation mean, Pastor? In the Greek, it's readiness. Or preparation, or it speaks of firmness, or solid foundation. What's Paul saying here? He's saying that, that we have peace in our lives. And when we have peace in our lives, we have, a firm, we have a firm foundation, and we have sure footing. Has anybody ever slipped and fell? And sometimes when we're older, we're not as graceful in the fall that we used to be. Sometimes we could catch ourselves, not so much now. But we must have that peace for a, for a firm footing. So Paul is saying when we have that peace in our life, we have a firm footing. Then we can step out in faith and, and not be moved by what we see or hear. The enemy wants to intimidate us. And the Greek word for peace here means, it means prevailing, conquering peace. Jesus has deposited in our hearts as believers prevailing, conquering peace. The shoes will give us a firm foundation. It's the shoes of peace. I've got peace like a river in the middle of the storm. How can that happen, Pastor? Some of us are losing the battle in our minds and in our thoughts and in our emotions because we're focusing on those things and we need to focus on the fact that God has given us a new set of clothing. He's given us shoes of peace. Peace that passes all understanding. Some people can't understand how you, can, how you can stand firm in the middle of the tumultuous things that come your way. And sometimes you feel like you're falling apart. But when you feel like you're falling apart, you cry out to Him and the Prince of Peace deposits that peace in your heart, in my heart, and it establishes us. It's wrapped around us. It gives us a firm foundation. And there are two kinds of peace. Two kinds of peace that the Word of God talks about and it, it is so, so important that if we miss it, sometimes we're going we're gonna to miss something um, tremendous and, and I don't want us to miss that today. So we're going we're gonna to elaborate that on in just a minute. Two different kinds of peace, or actually we'll do it right now. The peace with God. Peace with God. Peace with God. 
What does that mean, Pastor? That means when you and I accept Jesus Christ as our Savior, we're making peace with God. Some people say, have you made your peace? You make your peace with God by realizing that we're a sinner and our sin separates us from God. And all have sinned and gone astray and they've gone their own way, but the Lord has laid upon Jesus the iniquity of them all. That Jesus died on the cross and He arose the third day and He ascended to heaven and He's coming back. That, that, that He, when we said God, even if we said, said it in the weakest and the faintest of heart, God, if you're real, come into my life. Father, forgive me of my sins. Do you remember that day? Do you remember that moment when you asked Jesus to forgive you of your sins? And as far as the east is from the west, He removed our transgressions from us. And he buried it in the sea of forgetfulness. And he put an efficient sign that the devil cannot, cannot just resurrect the things that we had done. Because thank God, if the enemy comes and he, he looks at Wayne Hartsgrove and, and he reminds Jesus, look what Wayne Hartsgrove did. Jesus will say, listen, I don't see that. All I see is the blood of Jesus Christ that I gave up on the cross of Calvary. And as soon as Wayne Hartsgrove said, be merciful to be a sinner, as far as the east is and west, I have buried his sins. I have forgotten his sins to hold them not against them ever again. You know what that is? That's making peace with God. But do you realize that you can make peace with God and still not have the peace of God? Come on, church. Help me out today. Instead, we walk in fear and trepidation. We walk in anxiety. We walk in worry. We walk in turmoil. This is the reason that peace has been given to us as a weapon. The peace of God is a protective peace. A protective peace. Have you ever had in the most tumultuous storm, you feel the peace of God? It's inexplainable. In the middle of all the mess, somehow God deposits His peace in your heart. I thank God for His peace. I thank God for His peace. God, if, we, if we're entangled with His peace, anxiety and fear and worry and turmoil that is meant to take us out and, and, to, and to preoccupy in our minds and our hearts, in the middle of all that, God can deposit His peace. And I believe that God wants to give us a peace that dominates. He wants to give us a peace that dominates. Prove it, Pastor. If you want to turn to Colossians chapter 3, verse 15. Let the peace of God rule in your hearts. Let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you were called to one body, and to be thankful. So the peace of God that rules in our heart, Paul is commanding us here. It's not a suggestion. He's commanding us here. Let the peace of God rule in your heart. Now, I want to do some teaching today because I believe it's important. Rule is a key to understanding this overcoming, conquering, dominating, supernatural peace of God. Rule in the Greek is barul, and it, it portrays an umpire or a referee. I mean, there was a key call in the, in, in the uh, basketball game just a little while ago when the, when the, the Connecticut Husky ladies, had, there was only a few seconds left, and, and somebody, uh, the, the referee blew the whistle with only seconds remaining. And, and Connecticut was ready to, to drive to the hoop and, 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 to, and to just get the game tied up and possibly win. And all of a sudden, you know, it said that this person moved and it was a blocking foul. And, and the game was the hist and some of the commentators said the referee should have never made that call. But the peace of God should rule in our heart. What do you mean, Pastor? The peace of God portrays an umpire or a referee who judged the athletic uh, ancient world games. Pastor, why would Paul use this word to illustrate the peace of God ruling in our hearts? Paul is telling us that the peace of God, instead of fretfulness and anxiety and worry, it can begin to call the shots in our life. I ask you a question. The, the peace of God is an umpire. That's what it means in the original. And, and, and who's calling the shots in my life? Is Wayne Hartsgrove calling the shots in my life when I'm in duress? Or is the peace of God? The peace of God is a ruler. It's an umpire. He's calling the shots. When I call the shots, you know what I do? I mess up. You already know you don't have a perfect pastor. We'll be celebrating 20 years in a couple of months and and I know that I don't have a, I don't know, I don't have a perfect church, 
But I know one thing. We love God and we love his word. And we stand together in unity. And even when we disagree, we can disagree agreeably. Amen? And that's caused unity in our heart and the peace of God to be here so that people could come in and receive that peace, the Prince of Peace. It begins to call the shots. Paul is telling us that the peace of God, instead of fretfulness and worry, should be the one that's calling the shots in our life. You know what I say that I need to do today and maybe you need to do? Give up and let Jesus take over. Give up and let Jesus take over. Let the peace of God, this is what he's really saying. It's translated this way in this verse, if you want to look at it in the original. Let the peace of God call all the shots in your life. Let the peace of God umpire your life and your actions. Let the peace of God referee your emotions and your decisions. Whew. That's powerful. I got blessed, even if you all didn't. I'm going to read it one more time. Let the peace of God call all the shots in your life. Let the peace of God umpire your life and your actions. Let the peace of God referee your emotions and your decisions. Amen. Hallelujah. That's peace. And you know what? Peace is a defensive weapon. Paul used the Roman shoes and the soldiers to depict uh, the peace. That, that peace. You look no further than the shoes of peace. The grief, it began at the top of the knee and, 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 it, and it went down past the lower body and, and, and uh, the upper part of the foot. And, and it was necessary for, for, the, for the soldier to have these greaves on because if he didn't, they would be injured. And they were made of solid brass and bronze. Imagine that, the, the leggings that, 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 that were given to those soldiers. Why, Pastor? Because it had protected the soldiers from being bruised and cut in battle. A bruised leg or a bruised uh, foot could mean that that soldier could, could fall down and, and would be massacred. Also, the commanding officers would require the soldiers to, to walk the rocky, the rocky terrain and scale other areas without protective guard on their legs. Then they could be bruised or wounded. Have you ever had anybody come up and kick you in the shins? I hope not. If they did, I hope it's the last time they did it. But that would happen if they didn't have these greaves that, that, that the, the enemy could come up and kick them in the shins and they could fall down and, and they would be killed. You see, God has given us the armor of God that we need to put on daily. We need to put on daily. I get up in the morning and I put on the armor of God. I, I just, I just right from the word of God, I, I put on that helmet of salvation, the, the breastplate of righteousness, the shoes of peace, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. The armor that he has given us. The protective gear. I mean, you would be foolish if you're a football player and to go out there with no protective gear on. I have protective gear on. And in football, I, I ruin both of my knees. Even with the protective gear. But yet somehow we're getting up in the morning and we're going out into the world and we're not putting on the armor of God. He's given us his armor. He's given us shoes of peace. Shoes of peace. To protect us. To protect us. You see, the, the terrain out there is treacherous. Do you know that the world and the government and etc. is calling Christians really basically looking at us as the problem? We've been labeled. So we need to live up to the label. Not being the problem, but being the solution. Having the shoes of peace. That when everybody else is shattered by all kinds of things. I mean, I don't know what's going to happen. You know, with the eclipse. We got all kinds of things that are happening on the internet. All kinds of suggestions. All I know is I have my ticket booked to leave around 12 something on Tuesday and, and from Connecticut and fly and get into my, my son's, uh, you know, probably at around 530. At least that's my plans. So I don't know. In the hour that we think not, even so the Son of Man could come. Jesus, Jesus is standing at the heart's door of humanity and He's knocking. He's saying, if you will open the door, I will come in. If you lack peace, I'll give you peace. I'll give it to you like a river. I'll let it flow through your heart in the most tumultuous time. When you feel like you're going to give up, when you feel like you want to end it all, when you feel like you want to quit, I will saturate you. I have clothed you with my peace. I will give you the peace of God and you can have peace with God. And it passes all understanding. So, Pastor, I don't have that. 
I don't have that in my life. Well, that's the reason why God is reminding you and he's reminding me today. There's another reason the Roman soldiers wore these greaves of brass because the enemy would, would try to do anything he could to annihilate. You see, the protection. In many of our churches, we've lost our protection. It's the Word of God. Rather than, than changing our lives to fit the Word of God, across many of the pulpits in America, we've watered down the Word of God. But the Word of God is quick. It's powerful. It's sharper than any towards its sword. Piercing and dividing asunder of the soul and spirit, the joints and the marrow, and as a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Yes, it's good to have the elementary rudiments of the Word of God, but it's also time for us to graduate. It's time for us to be Bereans. Listen, I, I don't want you to follow me only if I'm following Jesus. And I, and I don't want to stand behind here and try to wax eloquent and try to change anything in this Word. I only stand upon the authenticity of the inerrancy of the Word of a living God. And the Bible says that, that He has given us shoes of peace. I know some of you are you're in turmoil right now. The devil has almost annihilated your mind. And you've given in to it. What you've got to do is don't isolate, insulate. Don't stay away from the family of God. I'm preaching today. Don't stay away from the family of God. We need one another. Oh, if I could sing, I'd sing, we are family. We are. We need Him and we need one another. The closer we get to the imminent return of the Lord, Hebrews says, forsake not the assembly together of the remnant for such a day. Capital D means the closer we get to the Lord Jesus Christ's return, the more people are going to think they can stay home and they got it on their own. Now it's different if you're, if, you're, if you're an invalid or if you're in home and, and you can't get out or something like that or you're sick or you're on vacation. I'm not talking about that. But you see, the enemy's trying to steal our joy. He's trying to steal our peace. You know what happened to us yesterday? We had 24 men. We had to set up an extra table. We had enough food to sink a battleship. But then we started sharing together as men. And what we shared there stays there, bearing our soul, praying. And then we had about four songs that, that went into about seven songs. And we were here praising and worshiping the Lord. And the peace of God settled into our hearts. How's it working for you doing it on your own? It doesn't work. We need one another. Look at your pastor. I need you. I need him most importantly, but I need you. So some people are probably thinking, well, now that you've got an associate, where are you going? I, I'm going I'm to make it really... I ain't going anywhere. <laughs> Just God sending in more reinforcements that we can work together for the kingdom of... Hey, listen, if Moses was called at 80, I'm just getting warmed up. <laughs> Do you need peace today? Do you need peace in your life? Do you need peace in your family? Do you need peace in your situation and your circumstance? The peace of God. How does... How does peace protect us, Pastor? With the peace of God in our lives, we can go through the most difficult situation and not be so cut and bruised because the peace of God is wrapped around us. It's ruling us. It's in the umpire of our life, and it's calling the shots. You know when peace dissipates from my life? When I start calling the shots. You do that, Pastor? Absolutely. Absolutely. Guys, I put my pants on the same way you do. I have struggles, just like you all do. And we have decisions to make. But we need to make a decision today that if God's given us a new set of clothing, we need to wear it. We need to put it on. Hallelujah. I don't like to fly. He said, you've been to Africa, you've been to Haiti, you've been to Czech Republic. I don't like to fly. I, ho I hope that... Uh, I hope that the guy, that the pilot, I hope he gets a good amount of sleep. I hope he gets a lot of sleep and a lot of rest. But you know what? When I get everything, you know, I get my clubs loaded and, and I get, uh, get my, my suitcase and this and that, I get everything. And once, once I get there and I get on board, you know what I do? <laughs> when that thing's taken off, I pray in the Spirit. Oh, yeah, I do. But then the peace of God just saturates my heart. Because I don't know. We don't know. I don't know how long I, I have in life. You know, I've got another birthday coming up soon. And I don't even know if I'm going to reach that birthday. 
But I know one thing. I want to live drenched in peace. I want the peace of God to rule my heart. Not the circumstance and not the situation. See, we rose above the floods that came into this church. And I believe we handled it, handled it by God's grace and mercy, giving him thanks even in the middle of all that. And then we got an insurance check to help us to take care of that. Some things that normally we wouldn't have been able to take care of. At that moment, it looked like tragedy. But God brought good out of it. So what you're going through right now, God is going to bring good out of it. He's going to deposit his peace in your heart. He's going to put it there like you've never had it before. Walk in peace. Walk in the peace of God. Let the peace of God call the shots in your life. I'm tired of calling the shots in my life. I don't want to call the shots in this church. I'm just an under shepherd. I want the Holy Spirit to lead us and guide us. Amen? Are you with me? I want the Spirit of God could do more in two seconds than Wayne Hartsgrove could do in a lifetime. I've been having ushers and teed up and saying, Pastor, we need to set up extra chairs. I thank God for their faith because I've done that before. I've done that for, for Easter. I've done that for Christmas and, and, and have all those empty seats looking at me. And I said, never again. What I'm going to do, Lord, is I'm going to be faithful and I'm going to keep the nickels and noses to you and, 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 and the finances. How many people are going to be there? I'm going to be faithful, God. I'm going to let you do it. It's much better. And he is doing it to the glory of God. You're here today not by happenstance, but by divine appointment that God wants to zap you with his peace, saturate you with his peace. Some of you have not been able to sleep at night. You're sitting there, you're tossing, and you're turning, and you're, you're thinking about all these other things. Let the peace of God call the shots. Let him be the umpire. Of life. Father, I resign, not really, but I resign kind of like today. I, I resign, and you be, you be the head of New Life Christian Center, Father. I, I know it can't, be, it can't be me to get this done. It can't be Pastor Ron. It's got to be as we yield ourselves to you. And we let the word of God be taught and preached and lived out and the peace of God infiltrate our heart and carry us through the tough times. I know what it's like. I know what it's like when I was in New Jersey to be in a, to be in a room with young parents and the little baby who was premature passed away. I know what it's like to see them hold that little baby in their hands and have to turn that baby over to the nurse. I preached that funeral in Titton Falls, New Jersey. And that casket was probably that big. Do you think I went up to that family and said, I know what you're going through? How dumb that would be. But you know what? When, when the peace of God calls the shots in our life, he's the umpire of our life, even in the most difficult situation. He'll put his peace in our heart. I need peace today. I need more peace in my life. How about you? I need more peace in my life more than I've ever had before. Isaiah chapter 26, verse 2, the Amplified. Verse 3, you will guard him and keep him in perfect and constant peace, whose mind, both its inclination and its character, is stayed on you because he commits himself to you leans on you, hopes constantly and confidently in you. You know what the spikes on those shoes did? It held the soldiers firm. Do you know what's going to hold us in the most? Listen, I'd like to tell you that it's going to get better, but it's not going to get better. You know what's going to hold us in all of this? Peace, the peace of God. The peace of God. The peace of God. God's peace causes us to say, whatever I say, Whatever I hear, whatever comes my way, Father, no longer am I going to call the shots in my life. I'm going to let your peace call the shots in my life. You're going to be the umpire. I'm yielding it to you. Whether you need a job, I'm thinking of Rob Swans, one of the key sellers. In, 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 and how long were you in that company, Rob? Years. Come on, you're a big boy. Let me know. Big, I can't hear you. 30, 30 years. years. And what did you get when they got you? Know, What'd you get? One. What are you doing now? And God has blessed him. And he had his first solo sale Saturday, right? 
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And you know what he said to us as a board? He's a board member. He said, you know, Pastor, in all this, I have the peace of God. God's put his peace in my heart. Reverend Ron and Amber, a year ago, God said, you, you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna go to something new. Something new is going to happen in your life. Change is going to happen in your life. Little did they know, and even then did I know, that they were going to be partnering with us together to be co-laborers for the kingdom of God. But God works things out. Dr. Hero preached a, a, a message, and he said, you know, cr the, the, you cross your hands because God picks the most unlikely because the most likely didn't want to be picked. The peace of God will protect and guard your heart and your mind. And I want to close with this in Colossians 3.15. And this is really as close to the original as you can get. Let the peace of God call the shots in your life. Let the peace of God umpire your life and your actions. Let the peace of God referee your emotions and your decisions. I got I to gotta, I gotta just share that one more time. Let the peace of God call all the shots in your life. Let the peace of God umpire your life and actions and let's, let the peace of God referee your emotions and your decisions. Do you know why that our emotions are all off the chart? All over the place? Because we don't have the peace of God. Several years ago, I went through probably the deepest trial of my life. Some of you know the story, some of you don't. A time in which, even at that time, sad to say to you, I didn't even know if I wanted to live. I was at the crossroads of my life and the enemy said, see that tree? Get in your car and kill yourself. I used to go in dark rooms because I didn't feel like I deserved the light. It was the lowest time of my life. And the enemy, John 10.10, 10, wanted to kill me. And he wants to kill you. But somewhere in all of that, I got a word from God. Someone sent me a letter and, and prophesied, gave a word of prophecy over my life. Said the latter years of your life will be greater than the former. I didn't have the peace of God right away. It was a process in my life. And it's a process, process in your life. But I, here I am. 30 years later, standing before you all by the grace of God. So don't look at your pastor and think he has it all together. If you're visiting us today, don't look at all of us because we were happy today and praising and worship God that we have it all together. No. Every one of us are confronted with the things that demands that we have the peace of God wrapped around us. Stand with me, would you please? Let the peace of God call all the shots in your life let the peace of God umpire your life and your actions. Let the peace of God referee your emotions and your decisions. The devil's going to always try to convince you and I that if we pay our tithes and give money to the church, I'm going to really preach right now, that we'll never have enough. I hardly ever say that we have a bowl over there. Oh, excuse me, I'm not pointing at Lori where we have our tithes and offerings. We don't broadcast that. Since COVID, we, it's there. But yet, do you realize that we increased, I'm not going to say because this goes online, we increased our budget to take care of an associate. I have seen over the years how God has taken members of this church where the district said, if, if, you don't, if people don't sacrifice, this, the, the doors of this church are going to be closed. And, and probably a couple of those families, only a couple of them are still here that sacrifice so the doors could be made open. I have seen time and time again every decision that we needed to make by faith. I've, I've never seen, I've pastored larger churches, I've never seen more capital per, per, per person money that's come in to bless people and bless ministries. You know why? Because the enemy wants to think that if you and I pay our tithes, that we're not going to have enough. That's a lie from the pit of hell. Why are you saying that, Pastor? So you can get more money? No, so that you can be under a blessing and stop robbing God. 
And then you know what the enemy says? Well, if you, if you devote too much time to the church, then you know everything else is going to suffer. I understand it needs to be God first, the family, then the church. But I want to tell you, we have one of the largest volunteer groups in this church, and if it takes a village to raise a child, it takes more than that to see a church go forward. And yet Gail and myself and others, we get credit for it, but you're all in the trenches, and we're doing it together. Now we're embarked on a journey that God has sent the Pettibones to work with us. And I believe, you know, Pastor Ron and myself, we've been talking about it. I believe the best is yet to come. I believe as long as we stay unified and we stop calling the shots in our life and we let the peace of God call the shots in our life and we let the Holy Spirit lead us, then we can do mighty exploits for the, you know, but, but, but Pastor, you're a small church on a dead end street. So what? God is a good God. So I, I, I want to I wanna call you who do not know Christ as your Savior. If those are viewing me right now, uh, by internet, I, I just pray that right where you are, and those of you that are here, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, come and receive Him as your Lord and Savior.